let's get to these comets and talk about what they're really made of, okay? Because we're not really seeing the comet itself when we see these bright comets. The heart of a comet, instead of looking like this big, 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 big streak across the sky, really looks more like this. This is the nucleus of Comet Wild 2. And in order to see it, you can't see it with, uh, just up in the sky. You actually have to go there. All right? This e the only times we've been able to see the nucleuses of Comet is when we have a space mission that travels to them. Here's another one. This is Comet Hartley 2, the nucleus of Comet Hartley 2. Right? It looks a bit like a bowling pin. And then we've also got another bowling pin, Comet Borley. Uh, I actually can call, these are actually very well known simply because there are only five comet nuclei that we've seen up close. That's it, five of them, and they're all here uh, to scale. Uh, we've got uh, Borley, Wild 2, and Hartley 2. We've also got Halley and Temple 1, which I will talk about both in just a few minutes. The point of this slide here is, however, to give you a scale of these objects. They are only a few miles across. The largest of comet nuclei are probably tens of miles across, not, not, not very large. So a comet in, its, in itself is really a relatively small object. And when you look at the shapes of these, well, they look rather similar to another class of objects. On the left is Comet Borley, and on the right is Gaspra, an asteroid. So in shape, at least, comets look a lot like asteroids. Which, of course, begs the question, well, what's the difference between a comet nucleus and an asteroid? Well, the simple thing is that the comet nuclei formed in the outer solar system, so they're mostly ices with a little bit of rock and dust mixed in, actually a lot of dust probably, um, whereas the asteroids formed in the inner solar system, and they're much more rock, and they may have a little bit of ice. So for elementary school kids, we simply say, okay, comets are ice with some rock, Asteroids are rock with some ice. But they are both the flotsam and jetsam, the things left over from the formation of the solar system. So you can see that comets look a lot like asteroids, but did you know that asteroids can also look a lot like comets? Here's a picture of an object called P2010A2. And this type of name is what we give to a comet, something that has a tail. And you can see a wonderful tail along here. But if we zoom into this region, we can see that it doesn't look like a comet because a comet is supposed to have a coma that gets smoothly swept back into a tail. Instead, you've got this sort of X-shaped pattern. What's going on here? This is not a comet. What we believe happened here is the collision of two asteroids. Asteroids collided, and the dust kicked off in that collision then gets swept back and forms this complex pattern here that then gets swept back into this tail. And you think, oh, well, that's just a special exception. No, actually, there are more. And last Thursday, Hubble released this, these two amazing images of an asteroid called P2013 P5, all right, where it's got not one, two, three, four, and not five, they tell me six tails. I can't quite see them all here uh, in these images. It's got six tails going off around it. And we have never seen anything like it. We truly don't actually understand exactly what's going on here. I'm going to have to say if you want more information, go to the press release on, on Hubble site to see more about it. But it underscores the idea that these tails that are, we always associate with comets, we can also associate them a little bit with asteroids. Okay, now, here is something where we wanted to look inside that comet nucleus. We believe that these comets and the asteroids are leftovers from the formation of the solar system. And it's sort of hoped that if we looked inside them, maybe we could understand what the original solar nebula was made out of. So we had a smash hit, or as I like to call it, washing machine crashes into iceberg at 25,000 miles per hour. This was the deep impact mission, and it went to Comet Temple 1. And basically, as the deep impact mission passed by Comet Temple 1, it released a probe about the size and weight of a washing machine that would smash into Comet Temple 1. You're looking at the camera on that probe as it approaches, and I've got uh, it marked 107 here in the upper right-hand corner. And as it gets further, it's going to go into this region. And it's going to go in towards this crater here. 
Let's go in towards the lip of this crater and get closer and closer and closer until it becomes all blurred out and the probe smashes into the, into the comet. Of course, the deep impact uh, mission was passing by, monitored it, of course, and this is before impact, and then you can see the impact, and we've got 16 of these, so I'm gonna go through them relatively quickly, and slowly the impact exposed material that was inside that comet, and stuff blew away. All right, now I'm gonna rewind, go back to the beginning, and show you the most important slides. Okay, so here's the impact. Now watch these next three slides. Here, here, here. You see that poof of material? That poof of material, that initial poof of material told us that the probe went really deep inside. That it wasn't very solid on the surface. That it was a very porous undersurface. Uh, we know that comets have these relatively crusty surfaces. Uh, but we didn't know it was underneath it and told it that it was very porous underneath and so we got this initial plume of material and then the secondary plume of material that spreads out. And so looking at that, we were able to tell that the, under, the material underneath the surface had a very fine consistency and I, one scientist described it as being about the consistency of talcum powder, which of course meant that it spread out across space. So the Hubble Space Telescope was observing. This is the pre-impact observation. And after impact, it brightened. And then another 10 minutes, the material started to flow away and further. And by about an hour and a half afterwards, there was this humongous spray of material. So the deep impact mission was able to send a probe, smash it into a comet nucleus, and expose some of the material from the inside, shows its consistency, but unfortunately, it also showed that the material was not pristine, was not the pristine material from the or origin of the solar system, was not the, uh, was not the composition of the solar nebula, that we were, it had actually been processed relatively deep inside the comet, so that promise idea of looking, at, of looking at the material from the original solar nebula was not fulfilled, but at least understanding the structure, in, the interior structure of a comet was accomplished in deep impact. Next up, dust in the solar wind. So that other comet nucleus that we haven't looked at yet is Comet Halley, observed in 1986 by the Giotto mission. And here you can see the nucleus of Halley, it's about eight miles across, but you also see jets of material. As the comet nucleus passes in close to the sun, generally uh, within the asteroid belt or is within the orbit of Mars, it gets warm enough for the ices in the, in the nucleus to um, sublimate, go directly from ices to, to gases. And that generally happens by the emission of these jets of, of gases. And those jets of gases then become this cloud around the comet, which, of course, which we call the coma. And this is a great picture of Comet Neat, and you can see this beautiful coma, all of these gases surrounding the comet. Now, I told you that the comet nucleus was only a few miles across, maybe 10 miles across. The coma can be 1,000 to 10,000 miles across, okay? 1,000 to 10,000 times larger than the nucleus. So you know that when you're seeing this, you are not seeing the comet itself. You're just seeing the cloud of gases, ices and dust gases around the comet. You're not seeing the comet itself. Then those, that, that cloud then gets swept back into a tail. And to understand how that happens, all right, we got the phone done? Cool, no problem. All right, to understand how it gets swept back into a tail, we gotta look at the sun. This is the photosphere of the sun, and it looks relatively quiet, except for it's got a few pimples on it, all right? Of course, each of those pimples is the size of our entire planet, uh, which is, you know, the sun has pimples the size of our planet. Uh, but it's, the, photos the visible photosphere looks relatively quiet. Of course, we know the surface of the sun is nowhere near that quiet, and we know because sometimes the moon passes in front of the sun. And the moon passes totally in front of the sun, you're able, during a total eclipse, you're able to see the outer atmosphere of the sun, what we call the solar corona. So during a total solar eclipse, you can see that solar corona, but what I can't show you in, a, in an individual image 
is that solar corona is extremely active. Fortunately, we have satellites up there watching it, and this movie is one of my favorite movies, and it shows you the, atmosphere, the activity in the solar corona over the course of one month. This is one month in the life of the sun, and it's not chosen to be a particularly active month or a particularly dead month. It's just one month in the life of the sun. And you can see all of those striations are actually outflows of material going away from the sun. This is the sun's atmosphere expanding into interplanetary space. This is the genesis of the solar wind, the wind that blows out from the sun and across interplanetary space. Well, that solar wind, as it crosses interplanetary space, will then take the gas, the cloud of gases around a, uh, a comet and then sweep them back into these extremely long tails. Matter of fact, it doesn't do just one tail. This is a comet of Hayaseki in 65. This is with one of those uh, Kreutz family comets. But it actually creates two tails, as shown in this picture of hale Bob. The straight and blue tail is the ion tail. As these, uh, as these gases are emitted from the comet, they can be ionized by the ultraviolet radiation of the sun, and then the magnetic field of the solar wind pushes them back quickly and straight, and you get a long, straight ion tail. The stuff that doesn't get ionized, doesn't have an electrical charge, is on the dust tail, and that gets pushed back mainly by radiation pressure from the sun, um, and that can actually have a curvature to it because it sort of lags, it goes out at a much slower pace, all right, and sort of lags and creates a, a curvature along uh, its path. Now, since the tails are being pushed by the sun, of course, the tails will always push away from the sun. A good demonstration of that is this movie of Comet Neat, from, again from Soho, and you can see the tail swing, swinging around as the comet passes the sun. I'll play it for you again. The tail swings around as the comet passes the sun. The tail does not follow along the orbital path, as so many might naturally assume. Cats in this, in, this, in this manner are like dogs, that sometimes they chase their tails. Matter of fact, comets, as they, as they exit, from the, exit, exit away from the sun, are always chasing their tails away from the sun. The other cool thing is that as it sweeps past the sun, that dust tail, oh, sorry, here, here's this, here's, here's this to show you that in a, in a single image. But as they sweep past the sun, you can get some amazing pics, and this is one of the most amazing pics, Comet McNaught in 2007. That's the other great comet of this century. And you can see the dust tail as it swung past through perihelion, creating this big, huge, long arc, again, only observable in the southern hemisphere. Uh, shucks for the rest of us up here. But this was an absolutely amazing comet, and this is it uh, over the Pacific Ocean. Um, off the coast of South America.